Yes, we got kicked out of the last room. <laughs> uh, I don't get into the details. Let's just say somebody was trying to do fighting and we got in trouble with that. So the university is super pissed. Uh, but we're here in the Gates building. So we're super excited to have Karsten Rohner today. From He's our last uh, visitor for the seminar series in hardware accelerated databases. So Karsten has a master's degree in physics, but a PhD from Leibniz University in computer science. Um, he's a continual startup founder. So he's the CEO of Swarm64, which he's going to talk about today. But this is now his sixth startup, yeah. all based in Germany. Um, no, some in Norway, actually. Some in, some in Norway, right? <laughs> so he's here to talk about Swarm64, which is a FPGA accelerator for, for Postgres and MySQL. All right, thanks. Go for it. Good. Thank you very much for coming and in such huge numbers. Much appreciated. So let me start with uh, some background information on uh, Swarm64. And we are actually also a Norwegian company, um, although all of us um, from the R&D side are in uh, Berlin. And then sales and marketing are here in the US and we are building out worldwide. So we are building Asian presence and so on. Right now we are 45. Hiring any one of you looking for a job, then uh, let me know. We can talk. We are also hiring in the US. And um, yeah, so we are growing uh, very rapidly. Um, our theme is uh, database acceleration. We think that's um, a market ripe for disruption. The reason is that increasingly people are moving out of proprietary databases into open source. Now, when they are in open source, what they find is they have trouble with performance. I mean, open source database software has been around a long time. It's really great. It's uh, stable. It's uh, field proven all well. The performance level is no way near the proprietary solutions. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring a completely new angle into it so that over time and really over time. So we, are, we continue to improve and improve and improve. And over time, we, of course, want to get to the level where you where, where commercial solutions are. And uh, yeah, so then we want to be a real threat to the to the established players because that's what startups are all about right be a threat to to the established players now when we started we set ourselves a few foundational principles we said what makes sense and what does not make sense and um, so the first observation we made was if you put an FPGA into the processing pipeline, then if you have a pure transactional system, um, the additional latency is going to kill you. So forget about transactions, focus on, uh, on analytical processing. That was number one. So we are focused on analytical processing. We're not accelerating any transactional workloads. Um, we might in future, we think, but that's uh, not today, not at all. The, the second um, principle we are following is we do not want to build yet another appliance. Um, there have been FPGAs used in databases in an appliance type. We think appliances are not a good idea anymore because in the cloud age, you know, you have to be scalable. And with an appliance, your scalability is you can scale your appliance, but at some point it's limited and uh, it's not a it's not a homogeneous computing architecture anymore. And uh, this is what customers want to get out of. So we want to we don't want to and we don't want to have an appliance and we also don't want to fork our host database. The reason is simply if you start building an appliance or you fork, you get for a short time, you get a big jump in performance because um, you, you can pull all the tricks, right? You can, it's kind of like taking a shortcut. So you're taking a shortcut, you're pulling all the tricks and you get a performance jump. But thereafter, because you have to maintain the, uh, the, the steadiness of uh, innovation yourself, you're you, the, the angle at which you improve your performance is relatively low. If you stay with the established, um, with the, with the established technologies, you are on the path of adding all their performance increases. And so the performance curve on which you are is much steeper. So over time, appliances always disappear because they are, they are being caught by the evolution of the standard technologies. So no forking. We are, we are using standard FPGAs. We are accelerating open source databases. We're not forking them. We are going through, through their established interfaces and provide our services to the open source database and so on. That's very important for us. 
<clears throat> of course, we, uh, as part of that, it's, uh, it's kind of self-evident we want to stay um, compatible, completely compatible um, to, the, to the host database. So, um, if, yeah, you, you, we don't want to introduce code changes to our customers because that's another very important uh, point for our customers. Um, they don't want to change their code base. That's for, for example, in finance, this is a huge issue. They have, um, they, they are regulated. And if you're regulated, you know, um, and you do code changes to um, part of your system that fall under the regulation, then you have to re, you have to get it re, um, reauthorized. And that is a, it, it's a big pain. So, um, we can't do that. Also, we have to be compatible to all the tools that are out there in the market. So we maintain complete tool and other, um, compatibility. That's really important for customers. <clears throat> then I already mentioned that we need to scale. Um, we are, of course, on a single machine, we are scaling vertically, but then this vertical scaling also needs to scale horizontally because we are in cloud environments and, and loads are increasing tremendously. Um, the, the customers we have, you know, they have meanwhile, um, since we started working with them a bit more than a year ago, uh, they have um, tripled the size of their analytical database meanwhile. So, and this is how, how it keeps going. So in a year from now, they will probably again have tripled it. And therefore, um, if we don't offer horizontal scalability at some point, we will lose them. So we, may, we, we provide horizontal scalability also. <clears throat> And then at some, you know, how do customers make the decision if they use this or that? Well, at the end of the day, it's uh, money, right? So the total cost of ownership and all these things play a fundamental role. And this is where actually FPGAs have a huge advantage. Um, just as an example, um, compared to GPUs, um, on our present platform, and this, this is platform de dependent, but on our present platform, um, it takes us 40 watts um, when the FPGA is fully loaded to deliver the acceleration. The acceleration is not only FPGA, there's also a software component, as I will explain, but still 40 watts compared to um, what GPUs are taking, you know, that's a six or something like, like that. And uh, so that's, and then 40 is really the peak, so at, at the average is even lower. It's really uh, very substantial um, in terms of, t of, of t TCO implication that you have a low power consumption. So. I've spoken a long time about it, but I think it's very important you that you understand where we are coming from so that you understand where we are going. And this is roughly, in, in very broad strokes, um, how the architecture looks. So you have your application, and I said you, you, you don't change it. Application also uh, means uh, tools like, um, you know, uh, BI tools as Tableau or Click or um, so on. And um, these tools talk to, talk to the database. And we are sitting below that database. If it is Postgres, then we are kind of directly integrated. But if it is any other database, as I will explain later, then um, again, we help that can help any database with analytical processing through a process I'm going to explain. <clears throat> and within that um, database, with, within our layer, we have standard Postgres tables and they are the standard just the standard Postgres tables, and we have swarm tables. The swarm tables are provided through the foreign data wrapper, which is an interface that Postgres provides. And the foreign data wrapper lets, um, lets tables look to Postgres. If you do it properly, with, it's a bit of effort, but you can do it. So those tables look to uh, the application just like any Postgres table. They don't, um, once the DBA has created them, um, with the create table command or create foreign table in this uh, case. So you create the table and once it's created, it's a table. And then the application uses it as it uses any table. That, that is um, how, how we're doing it. But it's a special type of table. And of course, it works on any storage architecture. So direct attached networks, uh, network storage, you have it. That's very important because we need to support enterprise type of uh, IT environments. We need to support the cloud. We need to be very flexible and that's how, how we do that. <clears throat> and uh, so now, how do we support all kinds of transactional databases? This is actually uh, through live replication. So if, you're if you have a post, even if you have a Postgres system, you don't want 
your analytical, your, your OLAP processing to be on the same server as your transaction processing. Because as soon as OLAP, as your analytics kicks in, your transaction performance goes down and you want stable transactional performance. Otherwise, um, your system is in uh, trouble, very obviously, um, particularly if you're, if you're customer facing or you need to achieve certain, um, at certain um, uh, response times, then you can't have that. So regardless, of um, what database we're talking about, um, the analytical part will always be separated from the transactional part and now you need to get the data from the transactional system. If you're working with transactional data, you might not. You might just have other type of data like IoT uh, data that just streams in. But uh, for now, I'm, I want to focus on this one use case, the other comes later. So if you have a use case where you have, trans where you have a transactional system and you want to analyze the data that's flowing into your, or that's being created in your analytic, in your transactional system, then you need to have a separate analytical system and uh, the way we provide that data is through live replication. And we can live replicate from um, all open source databases. Uh, we have not yet um, set up the live replication capability to other databases, but we are pretty confident that this is also possible. There are there are extensions available for Postgres, for example, to link up to Oracle, but we haven't uh, tested it yet, so I wouldn't claim it. Uh, it's just a roadmap item. For, but for now, uh, MySQL, Maria, Postgres, we can live replicate from all of those, and then we have the data and then an analytical system. And from there, we can you join the the uh, we replicate into the uh, or into the original the native Postgres tables, and then we just join that or copy it or how in any way you want, you can then um, get that data into the analytical tables and from there you, um, yeah, from there you an analyze it. So very, very much straightforward. <clears throat> this is how the system architecture looks. So we have an FPGA in the system and as with any hardware, it's a PCI Express card. So this PCI Express card goes into the PCI Express uh, slot just like a GPU or whatever else um, you want to put into your system. And so you have a driver, obviously you must have a driver to uh, control that um, piece of hardware. The driver then needs to get instructions of uh, what to tell that piece of hardware, at least in our case it needs to, uh, what to tell the piece of hardware what it should do. That's what we call the runtime. So the runtime is a piece of uh, software that's from us. It, I've, I'm logically separating it from the database. It's actually, in terms of, of, of software architecture, it's actually part of um, our database extension. Um, this is how um, we tell the FPGA what to do for certain queries, which is obviously necessary. <clears throat> So you have the runtime element and then you have the software stack which uh, plugs into the host database. So these are, these are the components and then of course you need to have um, what is called an image in FPGA terms. So um, this piece of software that configures the FPGA and tells it what to do because it doesn't um, from, from the outset an FPGA is like a white piece of uh, paper. And you can start uh, scribbling on it and you tell it what to do. And uh, that's, uh, it's, that's called an image, what tells the FPGA uh, to do. And this is what we provide. And when you start uh, the way we deliver this to customers for uh, trials, later it's different because then it's more productive. But uh, for trials, we just give them a Docker container. They start up the Docker container. And um, within, within the start up of the Docker container, the FPGA is being programmed. The, we load um, the extension into the database and poof, there it goes. You have a fully configured system. It's just running. So what we deliver is only software. The hardware comes then from Intel. Uh, beginning of next year also Xilinx, so we are currently um, porting onto Xilinx. We will support Xilinx 2 beginning of next year. Right now it's uh, Intel <coughs> and you can buy fully configured servers from a number of uh, server makers. Um, the big ones, they all have servers which are completely configured. So uh, the OS is proper, the driver is integrated, this particular driver is integrated and so on. So you can just buy the server get our software booth up running. No, no big deal, nothing special to do. Okay, so what's happening on that FPGA? Now, now it's getting interesting, right? 
<laughs> this is what you've been waiting for. What happens on that FPGA? Um, this will be disappointing, the level to which I go, and I apologize in advance, but um, we, we are filing patents for some of the stuff, and so I, uh, or we have filed them, but they are not yet granted, and so I have to be a little bit uh, restrictive, forgive me for that. But in general terms, let me see if this, ah yeah, this works. Okay, cool. So, through the plugin API to the host database, in, we, are, we are getting data. So, that data that comes in, if it is fresh data, it goes through this path into the uh, compression decompression engine on the FPGA and from there we store it and in the store in, involved in the storing of it is what we call the optimized columns algorithm. That's a special data structure we are using that minimizes the d um, amount of data traffic we need to generate on the, on the SSD in order later to grab data. So, with um, this particular algorithm, we kind of know where we are putting the data. We don't know it precisely, but we know it to the just right degree. Because if we knew it precisely, it means whenever new data arrives, we have to reorganize everything from scratch. That's of course nonsense. Uh, you don't want that because then your insertion speed uh, just goes down. So you want a very fast insertion speed. And the analogy I'm using is, um, students uh, might be might know this, um, so you have your uh, closet and then instead of putting everything neatly, what you do is you take your underwear and throw it up there and you take your shirts and throw them down there and you take your trousers and throw them there. So you have all these piles, right? And um, within the piles, it's um, uh, within the piles and also the piles themselves, they are roughly sorted, but you know, in the, it might happen that um, a sock ends up in the uh, underwear department, but then yeah, this, this is okay, because then when we fetch the data, then um, we on the FPGA, we are we'll find, oh, what does a sock do? We are actually looking for underwear, so we're just cutting out the sock and we're delivering only the underwear data. And you can also say, we only want the uh, red ones and not the black ones. Okay, fine, then we cut out the uh, red ones and only the black ones. Like, to take that yeah. for a metaphor and not actually put it into databases, yeah. like, what do you, is it a table, is it a column? What is, like, what is a piece of underwear? Is it a, is it a it's, a, it's, a, it, <laughs> it's, a, it's a data structure. Okay. It's a data structure. You can you can compare it to a log structured merge merge tree, yeah, okay, okay. but it's not a log structured merge tree. But you know the analogy is simple, is a little bit like that. Okay. Yeah, that will yeah. Okay, so that's how it how it works. Okay, so this is how we sort the data when we put it on on storage, and I just explained what happens when we get it back. So we get it back. Uh, and we look for it very precisely, then we decompress it. And once we've decompressed it, then obviously um, the, the data rate is much higher, right? Because um, this comes in at hopefully uh, full PCI Express speed, not always, but if, if it does, then this is now, uh, now uh, three to five times higher data rate. So you want to do stuff with it, and you anyway want to do stuff with, uh, with it on the FPGA. So what can we do? Well, one, um, of course, we are cutting out what I just explained. Um, we, we make sure that we only get the data we look for. But then um, we also have a hybrid a row column data structure. So analytical databases mostly are columnar databases. And columnar databases have a lot of advantages for data analytics. We have a huge disadvantage. The insertion speed is relatively low. And uh, we wanted high insertion speed because uh, we believe that um, the entire a connected devices market is an important one and there you have a lot of uh, insertion speed. And by, interestingly, um, this is how we started. What we later found is that, for example, in financial services where people are running nightly jobs for, I will show you an example later, um, where people are running nightly jobs um, for compliance to make sure that um, they, they comply with, with uh, for example, capital coverage rules. They need to load from a lot of da different databases all the data um, to prepare a nightly run and then they run it. And this collection and setting up and then uh, transforming of data takes huge amount of time. It often takes more time than the, than the analytics itself. At least it takes a substantial part of it, even if it's only a third then, you know, this is huge. And uh, with our technology, we can not only um, very fast ingest, we can also very fast transform. That's based on this um, data structure we're using. 
And this helps even in uh, cases which initially we didn't have in mind, but we found it was a good idea to do it. So um, we have this hybrid structure and through the bit masks, we can then decide which columns we, we will take into further up for processing to the CPU. So if you have a huge table with say 100 uh, columns and uh, your, your query is only addressing 15 out of the 100, then all those columns that are not addressed, we kick out here. In, the rea in, in, in reality, we are only loading maybe 20, so we will not even, because this, this algorithm um, also covers um, the distribution into, uh, of the columns. So we, we will load a few more, but not the 100, and then kick out uh, 85, but in, in fact, we might load like 20, and then the, through the bit masking, we uh, kick out all the columns that we loaded accidentally. And then uh, we almost have the columnar database performance, but then combined with the advantages of a row data structure. So then we have uh, filter conditions, and that is in simple terms, it does a bit more, but in simple terms, um, this is the hardware implementation of a where statement, so of a ranges. So when you say, um, I want um, to get back to my picture. I want all, I want all uh, shirts. But um, you know, yesterday I ate a little bit, so um, only size L um, and, and uh, M and S, you know, leave out. So give me, give me all the shirts, but only size L. Then um, this is where the size L will be filtered out, and all the others uh, will will be gone. So where size is from L to I don't know L minus or so. <laughs> I'm making it up here. This is what the filter does. <clears throat> Selective um, materialization is yeah what you would think. Um, data conditioning. I'm not going to explain too much. Basically, what it does is um, it arranges the data such that the up algorithm with which you analyze it upstairs in the CPU um, can run faster. Um, this, for example, one effect we can uh, generate with that is that we change the order, the runtime order of an algorithm. It, if it is uh, order n squared, then in some cases we can change it to, for example, order n, n times log n. Okay, And that already, if you have a lot of data, you can imagine that gives already quite, quite a nice uh, speed up. So things like that, we are, we are um, rearranging uh, the data in a way that um, the algorithm in, on the CPU can deal with it much more efficiently. So to the data, <coughs> hmm. it goes, comes into the CPU, yeah. then you shove it to the FPGA, it does the compression, then you shove it back up to the, the CPU, but then it writes it back down to the SSD. You can't go from the FPGA directly to the SSD. Um, that we have not implemented that. It's theoretically possible, okay. but for that you need um, what's called a root complex, PCI Express root complex on the FPGA, so that you can establish a direct PCI Express connection to the SSD. And um, yeah, we don't have it yet, but okay. that's that's. Uh, that's a technical detail. You can do it, you can't. And right now we are not. We have some other relatively smart algorithms and we are transferring the data at least by using the DMA engine on the CPU. So there's no software involved. It's just t uh, get me that data and then the DMA engine of the CPU just gets us that, that data. And also, um, yeah, we are, we, we are reducing the copying quite a bit, yeah. But there's a little bit of copying and that's, uh, that's a negative, so you're right. Um, one, one, uh, there's a lot to be still worked on. Okay, so all these things we do on the FPGA after decompression and then we are passing this on to the software stack. On the software stack, um, almost all of the um, further analytical processing is performed and um, then we just give the result Sometimes the complete result, sometimes there's some post-processing in, in uh, Postgres happening, not much, and then you have the result of uh, your query. So this is how uh, this works. I don't need to go there too. And this is a bit more on the optimized uh, columns. So basically, um, I've, I've explained the uh, principle in broad terms, and this is an example of if you have a standard multi-part index. So you, this is kind of an index, if you wish so, um, it's, a, it's a special index, so it's another way to look at it. 
You can say it's a log structured merge tree, but it's also a type of an index. We can have up to three dimensions here. Um, on, and so that you can think of an, another dimension added. This is two dimensional, but you can have, I can't draw that uh, well, so I've just draw, drawn it here in uh, two dimensions, but you can have a third. And so how does this compare to, um, for this very simple task? So you have, you're looking for data where the order number is between 150 and 15,000 and where the sold date is between two dates. This is how Postgres encodes dates. I don't ask me what those dates are. I, I, I don't know. But these are dates, okay? So then in, in, class, in standard Postgres, um, the DBA would put, off, would put an index uh, on it. And with, with that index, you find relatively quickly that data. Uh, we, we ran it and this is a so to say, real example. So what happens? First of all, Postgres um, or any other uh, relation database needs to load uh, the, the leaves of the tree, right? So you have a multi-part index and the leaves you need to load in order to look up where, where is the data. And then in this example, um, we find that Postgres would load one, two, three, four, I think it's nine, right? Um, would, would have to load nine pieces of, of data, okay? So it loads nine and uh, then it can continue to process. In the case of um, the optimized columns, it actually loads this, and we've indicated that the real data is uh, the highlighted area, and then you have some redundant uh, data. I, I explained it with the um, underwear where there might be a sock um, uh, uh, coming also with it. So the real data is here. We load, we load this entire thing, but we only load three. So we load three, and um, then on the FPGA cuts out from those three only the relevant part, and then only the relevant part is passed up to the CPU. So obviously this reduces I/O a lot. And I have a little um, demo, which I will show you later, a video of a demo. There you can see it very nicely. Yeah, please. Uh, go back one slide. Yeah. My question is, how aggressive is your compression scheme? Is, is the PCIe bandwidth the bottleneck here, so that you are willing to trade? <clears throat> yeah, it's not yet the uh, bottleneck. So right now we have a compression. Um, we, we compress between a factor three and five. Depending, I mean, compression is always data dependent, right? But uh, three and five is what we typically um, observe. That's, that's standard, like, it is. It is basically um, GZIP, you know, in a, in a in a hardware implemented way, a little bit. However. Um, we, as we are progressing, we are working now on a release um, which will come out in January, and then we will see the first time for several uh, several queries that this becomes a bottleneck. So we are currently working on improved uh, compression schemes, and um, yeah, so that that's we we are improving it because we must. Um, the better. The th I, I, I'll explain. Let me get back to that later because um, I have a slide which speaks to why that is important. Um, it's important. Thanks for the question and why I will I will explain uh, just in just a second. So um, so this reduces then um, the I/O load. And again, um, the video I have will show that. So and this is the slide I was referring to. It's, I didn't know it comes up so soon. I, I forgot. I should know, but uh, I forgot. So here we go. If you want to accelerate then what you really find is you need to ex you need to accelerate consistently along the entire pipeline so if you say the data source provides you something at 1x throughput right then your compression increases the effective throughput not the raw data rate but the effective throughput what you really get in terms of data by the compression factor okay then we have our pre-processing on the fpga <coughs> And that, again, depending on what query you have and so on, we observe between a 1 and 5x acceleration of the effective uh, throughput in terms of data rate. Then we have the optimized columns. They have a huge effect, so between 3 and 20 times. Um, I will show you examples of how well we accelerate, and then I can show you where it's 20 and where it's 3 times. It's very obvious, you will see it. <clears throat> We have some algorithmic optimizations. Um, this is an area where we are just starting. So I would say currently we are more here, but we uh, um, we work on on getting more here. And and then another very important area is um, you unless 
you can load the CPUs fully so that the CPUs then um, um, need enough data from the, that the FPGA can process. Um, unless you can, you can achieve this, um, it's also breaking down. And this is simply Amdahl's law. Look, um, if you have a certain amount of processing that's happening in the database stack, right? And this takes time X. If you can't reduce that, and um, the rest of the pipeline you are already accelerating tremendously, then the acceleration factor is limited by, by this. That's simply Amdahl's law. So if you want to overcome this hurdle, and if you want to make the entire processing faster, Amdahl's law tells you, you need to make everything faster. So this also needs to come down. That's why we cannot only care about the FPGA, the FPGA and the scanning part of the database we can make tremendously fast if we do not also help by, by means of the FPGA the CPUs to be more efficient. So the load on the CPUs to go up, then Amdahl's law bites us from behind and uh, there we go. You know, it, uh, we, we don't have enough acceleration. Therefore, you need the entire pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. So I think they're the speed up. Yeah. Some of it's going to be throughput, some of it's going to be latency. So do I add a speed up, do I max? They don't seem to be all the same. Oh, no, no, this is all throughput. I'm not talking about latency. Latency, we, 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 are, um, we are very wasteful with latency. So, so, <laughs> so then, then the, the speed up is the minimum speed up I see? No, the, the speed up. The speed up really depends on the. the I, I I have a slide on that. The speed up very much depends on the so type I of multiply, query. Do I multiply these things? Yes, so you multiply them. Yeah. So it gets faster and faster. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. You multiply their effect. Well, the effect is multiplied. Of course, it's all you know. Yeah, it, it's it's a little bit of an artificial. It's a little bit of an artificial. Um, yeah. 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 It's just to explain that. The, the, the purpose of this slide is simply, I want to explain that you need all the elements unless you have, you're going through the entire processing pipeline, you're not going to have proper acceleration. That's basically what I want to say here. And then I've broken down the elements of what we're doing and what they are today and where we hope them but to the go. The yeah. um, actually, no. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. But look, um, here, in order to achieve a greater degree of parallelism on the CPU, what we do is, for example, um, we, are, we are partitioning the data such that the CPUs, when, when they go parallel on a certain, for example, on a join, when you, when you do a join in parallel, um, what limits the degree of parallelism is how, how often the CPUs need to exchange data. If you partition it properly, they don't need to exchange data so much, and then your effective degree of parallelism goes up. And that's what the CPU, what the FPGA does. But you could do that in a CPU. Yeah, of course, you could yeah. do everything we do on the, on the FPGA on, on the CPU. So, but what, what, so what is the benefit of the FPGA over the CPU? Like what, like what is the speed up? Uh, yeah, well, this is the, when, if, you, if your CPUs are fully loaded, then what I, you, you, you're paying for what you're doing on the CPU, by um, reducing your total performance, right? So, of course, you can. I mean, uh, it's like, uh, why are you using um, a, a GPU? Uh, you could also use a CPU, yeah, but it's, you know, for some things it's faster, for others it's slower. And um, for example, so just the compression. Let me, be, let me be specific, just the compression, okay? Just this compression algorithm we're using today, which is uh, relatively straightforward, um, that will take a complete core on um, Intel um, processor. You know, it, it has, I don't know, four, six, up to 16, and one, at least one core, um, this, this is consumed. So um, this is, okay, you can say, well, what one core, yeah, do you really have such a degree of parallelism? Maybe you can afford it. But then here, the uh, pre-processing that takes a, another few cores, because after the compression, your data rate goes up, so then you need many more cores in order to deal with the data rate. And so, all of a sudden, it's adding up, and then you're slowing down, because uh, you, those cores are not available anymore for processing right, only. But you, I mean, you're shipping stuff back, back and forth to 
you know, from the CPU to Pizza Express. Like, yeah. Well, we can. Uh, you already said yeah. you're bad at least. Yeah. Lately. Well, well, we don't care for latency because we, we care for throughput. We are in, in data analytics. If we were transactions processing, your argument would be absolutely true. If you do transactions, then latency is really, really, really important. For us, latency is, you know, yeah, you can't overdo it, but to a degree, it doesn't matter. You want throughput because this is useful not for, say, a 100 gigabyte database. This is useful uh, for a terabyte. Or It starts to have significant advantage from 300 gigabytes and upwards. But if you have very small databases, yeah, sure, then you wouldn't do this. But if you have a small database, you anyway don't have performance problems. So but there you are. Another yeah. way to, to interpret it is hmm. So you say you, you, can, you burn out cores, but instead of putting FPGA, you can put in another whole processor Instead, yeah. right? so, yeah. uh, so, so is it? I think you mentioned it, is it, it's also performance per watt. Performance per watt. It is. It is a total co total cost because um, the the FPGA is of course uh, much cheaper, and so so it's it's adding up. But no, it, even in raw performance, it's very simple. If you could do, you 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 can you can implement all of this on the CPU and you. It, yeah. 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 Using up a core. You don't like, to, to subtract that way from the computing part doesn't quite work. So I think it's a bigger yeah. picture here on yes. what's, what's forcing, what, what makes FPGA <clears throat> the enabler. The, the, yeah, so you the FPGA actually is used here and here and here and here. So in four of the, this is a simple software uh, strategy, but we need this um, in order to have an, a data structure that, that's efficiently processable on the FPGA. So again, um, but the FPGA is actually working on all, on four out of the five steps. So this is where, where it's supporting. And, and arguing with the cause is, okay, I, yeah, you're right, uh, it's an oversimplification, but, but at the end of the day, what, if you want to measure if this is useful or not, you simply look at is it faster or not. Yeah. And if, if it's faster, it's good. If it's not faster, then it's not good. TCO, right? Faster than uh, running everything on the CPU. Cheaper than the TCO you mentioned. Well, it's, first of all, it is uh, cheaper. Secondly, it's also faster. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, this is, yeah, no, I've, I think I've explained it all. Um, let me quickly go through it. Um, I'm, 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 I've explained it. So what are we using? We're using this row column hybrid uh, structure. Basically, this is our trade-off between um, the, the speed at which we can insert and write amplification. And um, this, is, this is particularly useful in uh, cloud environments because if you have storage and compute separate, then it is very, very useful to, to lower the traffic, uh, the data network requirements, and that you do through uh, compression and uh, other means. So, so for hmm. this row column hybrid yeah. data structure, hmm. I'm curious about what most specifically what does this mean? Like uh, you have multiple columns, sorry, you have multiple columns, and you put this the, the multiple columns of the first two or second two and just all, all the way down to the end? Or is something more like a pack, so you have a block, and within block you have a pure column store? Within the block, we are storing parts, I mean, either a whole column, if it's a, sm a small one, or part of a column. So when we load, we're loading all the blocks that belong to that column, mm -hmm. and um, we are allocating... So within each, within a block is only that column, it's not like... Uh, it can be, the block has a fixed size. Okay. So if the column um, is not a multiple of the block size, then you might have already the beginning of the next column within one of the blocks, for example. And this is what I meant with the sock that is uh, part of the underwear. If you only want that column, you're also getting part of the next column and you just cut it out on the FPGA. So we're putting, we are distributing the columns onto many, many blocks, maybe one block if it's a small column, many blocks if it is many columns, yes. And then, you know, um, this way we build the entire table by distributing the columns um, indexed uh, by the rows and, uh, distribute and, and use this optimized uh, uh, column algorithm in order to store them. Yeah, very well observed. So this <coughs> hybrid data structure is going to help you read less data when you do the query processing. Yeah. But how 
how does it uh, improve the ingestion speed? Because you still have to write all the data you get. Yes, um, the ingestion speed improvement actually is not um, through that particular uh, technology. The ing ingestion speed improvement again comes uh, from the compression because we need to push less data across. And um, it also comes because, um, well, it, it, um, we don't have an indexing overhead. We have an, a built-in implicit indexing and index, indexing data before you commit it in a database is a very expensive um, a workload. So it takes a long time to compute the, the index and then store it. If you do, if you compute the index later, well, then you have the, this overhead. You just shifted it, but you still have it. And um, <clears throat> in many cases, without an index, the database performance is just super poor. And therefore, um, the net um, insertion rate, which we achieve compared to um, a database with that at some point needs to index, is so much higher. Right, so that's basically what I'm saying. So at the end of the day, we also need to write the same amount of data, but the the the, the amount of processing we need to do before we write it is much less. That's basically what's happening. Yeah. Still a little bit unclear about the row side of your structure. So, so what is what exactly about it do you think that makes it more like a row than a column? Because the uh, the the index basically the indexing is working on uh, rows. But you still so, have to do multiple files to access a single logical role. Well, you you do you you do as many IOs as you need in order to fetch all that data. So we did we the algorithm that distributes the data column column wise and row wise onto um, onto those storage blocks which we are storing uh, basically makes sure that we. Um, only roughly only load as much data as is basically necessary, but there is a little bit of uh, overhead. So we're always loading. Typically, we're loading a little bit more, and that's what I explained. What the FPGA then cuts out, but yeah. So there is some overhead, but um, not not gigantic. So, so part of your data is stored in pure row format. Yeah. Um, you, you know, this is where. I, where, where I, I would now have to explain what I don't want to explain, so <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> pardon me, yeah. But your question is very good, yeah. So, <laughs> my fault, but okay. So, um, we, we eliminate the indexing over here. That's exactly what I just uh, explained the compression, um, and then the. Uh, we've also implemented it such that we have a very high latency tolerance and that's important when you work in a, a network storage environment. So um, if if your analytics process um, it, it, as, as a step in it basically depends on a later on, on data which you only pull a, as a condition of what you have looked for earlier, you know, so we have an if statement in other words, kind of, then um, if you have if you um, have a very, if you implement it in a way that you really have to wait all the way until the data ar arrives that uh, you then need, then you you are very latency sensitive, and this slows down this type of analytics. And we've built it in a smarter way that uh, we make sure we have the data earlier. And again, so I will not explain how we do that. <laughs> I intercept your question. And um, this makes us very latency tolerant and therefore we work extremely well in, uh, in network storage environment. And we have a, um, it's also a little bit frustrating to uh, disk makers. Uh, so we ran a benchmark of, um, <laughs> we ran, ran a benchmark on a very fast uh, SSD on um, a slower one and then on a very cheap one with um, with a hardware rate which is really high latency and poor and you you have it <laughs> and, and the, our performance between the very fast ssd and the hardware rate cheap ssds is only is minimally minimally different because we just we just work it out the only difference is uh, you need to have as many ssds uh, that you match the bandwidth of the very fast storage environment, but if you match the bandwidth, then the uh, the additional latency 
we can tolerate that. So it's bad for SSD makers because um, for if, if, if we are there because we don't need the, the slow latency SSDs. Fortunately for them, there's still the transactional part and that needs it. So, but we don't need it. Okay, then. Um, on the software side, we have the um, row column hybrid structure. I, I spoke about the optimized columns. I uh, spoke about that. And um, we are, this is another element of uh, the compression scheme. We are keeping all data everywhere, also in main memory, compressed. And that, of course, means we have a much better caching. So if you keep your data in main memory compressed, then obviously the um, amount of data that you have available is x times x being the compression factor higher in your caches than, than if not. And we use uh, that, um, this, is, this helps for the system level caches like Linux keeps IO caches and stuff like that, um, the caches that database keeps. So throughout the entire caching, even in the, uh, the um, the cache hits of the CPU are being improved um, because we keep the data uh, compressed everywhere and only when it's uh, needed we decompress it. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I think I've explained all that uh, already. I've just, I just have it here <coughs> as, as a backup material if, in case um, you later want to read it and you have uh, forgotten what I explained on all those graphs. But, uh, pardon me? Is it read, read it from where you have something written more originally? Um, this is, no, this, this is what I just explained. Um, I, I've, I've explained all of this um, on the prior slides. So I just wrote it down in case you later, you know, uh, you later want to, you want to watch it on YouTube and then understand what did the guy now mean? Here it is all written down again, okay? So, now, um, this is my first uh, video and I, I want to show you this. Here you see the effect of the FPGA and of the, of the optimized columns. So um, this is disk I.O., the black line here. This one is disk I.O. The yellow line is the FPGA and the, um, this whatever color, bluish color this, uh, this is, is the CPU load. Okay, so we are, and this is query 12 of the TPCH benchmark for a 300 gigabyte uh, data set. So as I said, the higher, the, the larger the data set, the better performance, but then it also takes longer. And so we've chosen something meaningful. So what you see is the FPGA kicks in with up to two, almost two gigabyte per second. And then later it runs at approximately one gigabyte per second. But what you see here is there's very little IO, very, very little, you see, not much happening. Whereas here you have a, a much, much higher IO load all of the time and we're done after 28 seconds and because it's reading, 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 uh, Postgres uh, needs so much and this is already Postgres 11 which is a lot faster than prior versions and I don't want to let you wait now um, until this finishes because it takes forever so let me do a fast forward <laughs> and here you are. Wow. So we are 20 times faster. And uh, this is a relatively complex query. I will show you later um, other queries where we are even more, even a lot faster than this 20 times. So this is the combination of FPGA and um, Optimus column structure and everything that I explained. So now this is what I meant. Uh, we can discuss, can you also do it on CPU or not? Um, maybe someone can build something like that and then can add more CPU, I, I don't know. Uh, we chose to do it on FPGA and we achieve uh, fantastic results. So, you know, that's, that's, um, that's a kind of the proof of the pudding, right? Because, uh, and uh, I have more performance examples. Actually, why am I doing it by hand there? I don't know. So this is what I, what I was announcing when I said um, performance also depends on, uh, on certain uh, factors uh, on, on, the, on the type of the query. So here you see the throughput drawn by type of query. This is a very, very um, join heavy query. We have not yet done a really good job with accelerating joins. Um, it's, on the, it's on the roadmap and um, Q1, Q2 next year, this number will go up a lot because then we will have more support um, on the FPGA for joins. So there we are accelerating, or we are getting an effective throughput of two gigabyte per second, which is already a lot faster than, uh, it's, it's roughly three to four times faster than uh, Postgres, but this can grow. 
Here you've just seen it, this was 20 times faster. Query 6 of uh, TPCH is a query where basically you're doing a very deep scan and um, it's, it's, it's a very incomplex, let me put it this way. So it's a very simple uh, query and we are accelerating by approximately 100 times. And literally, this is 100 times faster. So uh, this is getting into, into, the, into the region. You can run this, of course, also very nice on, uh, on uh, GPUs because this is simple stuff. They can do it well. And they, if they keep it in main memory, I would think they are still a little bit faster but they, they would completely fail uh, here. This, this they have to put to the CPU. And uh, here we are getting very close. And if you have a very simple drill down, like this famous New York taxi ride, that's what, what uh, people uh, often hold up. You know, they say, okay, you, you're looking for a taxi that left at uh, between uh, 1 and uh, 2 p.m. and that was going into a certain direction and, I don't know, uh, had some other characteristic. And now give me all the taxis to which this applies and you have a terabyte uh, database and now give, give me a result. That kind of stuff we can do an, at an effective uh, throughput rate of 256 gigabytes per second. So uh, you have a terabyte of data in four seconds, you get the result back. Again, a GPU might do that in uh, less than one second, but who cares then anymore? And this is, yeah, really, this is because uh, at the end of the day, a customer runs a whole set of queries and um, they have lots of these and lots of these. And then if you look at the complete, if you look at the complete workload, then it's really important that you accelerate everything. And uh, that's what we, that's what we do. And our, our entire development effort is going here. We are not doing much here anymore um, because we, we think this is uh, for the time being fast enough. And here is where we are walking, working and this, this will go up. And as a side effect, this will also a little bit go up and this will a little bit, but not, not so much. So here is where we are working because we believe that this is what customers at the end of the day care for the whole workload. Thanks, James. <clears throat> Good. So, um, questions? Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering what do you think? Okay, so, so one way to... Let me have a sip of water. Hmm? Is it possible that you keep all your algorithm, your software stack the same? So do you use the same thing on, on a GPU instead of FPGA? Right. Another way to ask this is that what do you think is the main advantage of using FPGA than a GPU? Is it because it's cheaper, because you can program it, or you have more memory, or like what's the main advantage you think? The the main advantage, now James left, but um, he, will, he would not heavily if I say that. The main advantage is that we have a much stronger roadmap with the FPGA. You know, um, so we've chosen we've chosen a path um, for our product development, which is a, a little bit more um, difficult than um, if you just put everything into main memory of a GPU, you know, and we, uh, you have HBM and then you push it through the GPU and then um, this kind of uh, stuff you can do uh, really well. And for the time being, you know, um, maybe you could do what we do also um, on, a, on a GPU, but um, there are a lot of uh, new technologies coming up for the FPGA. So partial reconfigurability, which means you can in, at runtime load new functionality onto the FPGA. And that means you can react to what's happening and then make, make different and other functionality available. Um, and um, <clears throat> Uh, FPGAs are coming with um, memory coherency, so uh, QPI protocols and stuff like that are being made available. Uh, HBM is coming to FPGAs. We don't have HBM today. Um, this is um, this is limiting. If the, if H HBMs would not come, it would limit us. But they are coming. So from a roadmap perspective and from uh, where FPGAs can go there's a lot of uh, room for more improvements. And as I said, um, I, would, I would dare to claim that in an overall complex workload, typical customer complex workload, if it's not just simple stuff, then um, we are better than the GPUs already today. But then we'll, from a roadmap perspective, we have a lot more capabilities. So that's why we've chosen FPGAs. And you get all of that for 40 watts instead of 220. And this is a real consideration. I mean, data centers are limited 
by the amount of power they have available. At the end of the day, you can only do so much in one data center because you only have a certain power supply. So if you can do what you, uh, if you can do something with 40 watts instead of 200 whatever watts, then this is so much more you can do in that specific data center. So it's money and that's, that's what counts. So we believe this is um, the better roadmap and we are willing to um, in, invest in the pain of step by step delivering it. Yeah. Everything we do today is RTL built. Um, high, level, high level synthesis is getting better and better so we can then start uh, synthesizing stuff, uh, partial reconfiguration, so you see the possibilities and um, we are all, this is all stuff we are working on. So we think this gives us um, a really, really strong roadmap. However, it's difficult stuff, so you have to have people who understand it, but we've built a team and with that we can do that. <clears throat> okay, so um, a few more examples. Uh, oops, this was too fast. It's a very sensitive this little thing here. Um, so we can monitor two Ethernet um, lines in terms of insertion speed. We can monitor two Ethernet, uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet lines at f at uh, full speed, i.e. the smallest IP packages possible, and insert that data in real time into the database. This translates into 30 million rows per second. So the data rate is not very high, but the amount of uh, rows inserted, uh, the, the number of tuples inserted here is extremely high. And this, nobody else um, can do that unless you, even in memory databases, find this super, super difficult. I think we are, ah, we are beating in memory databases here, I would claim. Um, they can comment then on YouTube if that's not the case. <laughs> um, these are ready. I, I show you the next slide that I can answer that. So, and um, then with with something for, for this particular use case, where then later you want to say, okay, now um, this is for network security. I don't, I want to, I had a break in into my system and a hack, and now I want to know who did it, what, what, what protocol have they used, which IP addresses were involved, and so on. If you want to look for that, um, then very quickly, and this is this drill down type of analytics that I mentioned earlier, and these are real benchmarked uh, data. So we have done this, we have done this. Uh, we can uh, drill down through that data with um, the type of analytics you use to get a first grasp of what happened and what, uh, what actors were, in were involved with the more than 3 billion, 3.4 billion uh, rows per second. So extremely fast you get an answer um, in this kind of environment. Other ex and, and this is uh, the insertion performance oh, this is the insertion performance um, over the size of the tuple. So here, the orange line is the uh, number of eight byte columns we are inserting. So starting with two, four, da, 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 up to uh, 40. And um, this is then the resulting, I've smoothed the curve because it looks a little bit, um, this is a rough measurement. So um, just to show the trend better, I've smoothed it. Um, so this starts at something like uh, 700 gigabyte per second for this very high uh, 38 um, million tuples per second. And then it goes up to 1.2 gigabyte per second when you have, uh, when you have larger columns. Okay. So th there is a, th this is a dependency basically between uh, the size of the uh, columns and or number of the columns actually and um, the insertion speed that you have in, in terms of tuples per second. This is like a single box with one FPGA? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Single, single box, one FPGA only and so on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you have more, then yeah, this goes up accordingly. It scales, uh, scales very nicely. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> this is basically now the proof. I, I can, so that you don't feel I'm telling you a lot of things and don't prove it. I like to prove stuff and this this shows it. So this is again a video of um, of insertion. So starting up then uh, there's always some latency involved. And here you go. Um, this is uh, 18 million rows per second. Uh, this is pretty old but uh, the important thing is this is Postgres here down, down here. You see the little? So 
that's um, of course this is um, super high insertion performance but um, this is what we do and this is what Postgres then can do so uh, very very fast so, so the, the, the tuple shows up you shove it to the FDJ it compresses it and then you write it back out to the, to the SSD to the SSD yeah all, all of this is committed to the SSD at the end of the day it's fully committed yeah yeah it's, so ACID compliant okay and um, Another example is IoT machine control, um, because um, since we are using all the capabilities of Postgres, we can even work with stuff like JSON data uh, structures. So if you have an IoT network where, where your sensor data is delivered in JSON format, no problem, we can do it because Postgres can do it and uh, we are relying on Postgres. So um, this compares to um, Mongo. We had a customer um, who was using Mongo and they wanted this accelerated and uh, we could, this is actually, this was a Postgres 9.6, meanwhile we are a ton faster, but even that uh, was, is quite impressive. Um, another example is uh, this, oh, go back, um, another example is this, where this is a customer um, that does financial analysis, so they are, they are extracting for many marketplaces the order books, the trades, and the market data. This is not um, in real time, but they because they are um, high frequency trading, so they collect all the data in in a file in, inside the stock exchange. And in for high frequency trading, you have your servers very close to the stack of stock exchange servers. So they are writing the click file throughout the day. They call it click file this stuff. So they write it throughout the day. And then at night they download it and then um, they put it into a staging database and then they they take the uh, they transform the data such that they have a combination of orders trades uh, some market information that was happening so twitter feeds what a lot of different uh, market data and then they combine that and in the production database, they have then a data structure where they can then say, okay, after this tweet, what happened? What happened to the order books? What happened to the orders? What happened to where orders canceled? Stuff like that. And obviously, what the reason they do that is they want to better understand the trading strategies so that then the next day they can adapt and the next day they can adapt and they can get better over time, uh, all of the time. So um, this is pretty complex, particularly also the transform step is uh, not highly non-trivial with um, these different uh, data. They also come not at precisely the same time point, so you, it, it's, uh, it's very complex, but uh, we accelerate that quite a bit. And um, here is, um, again, a video that uh, basically sho shows this, and the videos I need to start by hand, as you've meanwhile learned. So here we go. Um, you, will, you will see um, what's happening and just it, it's starting it's starting okay so this is filling up the staging database is filling up Postgres database equ equivalent staging is filling up then from staging we transform immediately immediately into the analytics DB so as soon as data arrives it's being transformed and as you see we keep a constant lag of one second and this fills up and this fills up and here's Postgres and the lag is growing and growing because the transform process just can't keep up. And when it's when this is full, the business intelligence will run. So we've taken 10 um, queries from TPCH and um, we are running them on this data now, now that it is available. So here the business intelligence is now starting and this is still uh, filling up. And this emulates um, this uh, process that I've shown you for, uh, at, uh, for this uh, customer. Okay, so this is now going, going, going. There's some fast forward built in. Otherwise, you would be standing here a long time. And, um, yep, so let's see. Ah, yeah, okay. So ingestion, um, we needed uh, four minutes and 24 seconds, 14 minutes for Postgres. Transform again, four minutes. Um, this will run a little bit longer and business intelligence um, we are already running. Postgres is still waiting for the data to become uh, available and so uh, it keeps going and uh, going and um, yeah so we will be done very soon here and um, okay so it keeps for, uh, going forward but it just again takes long let me just show you the end result so I'm not uh, wasting too much time. Oops, now I'm 
I haven't done a good job here in grabbing it and here we go. So, end result is <coughs> Swarm needed 66 minutes for this data set and Postgres needed uh, 310. So this is, I believe, four and a half or something like that acceleration. This is very complex. This is really uh, complex stuff. So you, you're inserting high speed, you, you have a complex transform and then you're running your business intelligence uh, queries. And so this entire process, we are accelerating by four and a half times. So that's, um, and this is really what we're targeting to get back to this GPU question. We believe that this is what uh, customers need. And we're seeing it at many, many customers. They have a workload, a complex workload that's made up of a lot of things. And um, what they want is everything fast. It doesn't help them if it comes back to <laughs> Amdahl's law on a, on a higher level, you know. Um, if, if you only accelerate some queries and you make them super fast, but then if they have a lot of other queries where you don't accelerate at all or you even slow down, this is not the business value. And at least this is how uh, we look at it. Okay, so... Very much yeah, um, so... Does this integrate into systems? Yes, very well. Because um, we are Postgres uh, compliant, this is ap totally application compatible. You can plug it into your system, no code changes, nothing. You need to create those uh, tables and uh, schemas uh, by a DBA needs to do that. But thereafter, everything is just completely completely um, compliant. The FPGA is virtualizable, so you can run this entire thing in a virtualized, fully virtualized environment. And um, we are being supported by all the common tools and we are also um, compatible to all the front and back end tools. So, you know, here's an example for an example for a typical environment and um, Kafka, Rabbit, MQ, all these input uh, ingest tools we can link up to and you, they can insert into a swarm uh, cluster. Um, you can have um, uh, storage separate uh, or not um, and so on. All, all the analytics tools, we all support that. And so this is, this can just, you can rip out your existing uh, Postgres or other database and you could and put this in into your existing environment and it will just work. And so um, there's more possible, for example, I like this one, um, the spatial extension. So you can do, there's so many extensions, you can have Twitter extensions, you have whatever, all works. And so in summary, I started with what were our uh, founding principles and here, um, well, so we're extending Postgres, accelerating OLAP and it coexists with transaction systems. So that's very important. You have, can have a transaction system and you can have your OLAP system separate uh, to that, but it can link, it can be linked so that you have more or less real time uh, OLAP queries running while you do, you're running your transactions. We forked nothing. It's not an appliance and there's no lock in. If someone doesn't like us anymore, they can always replace us with poor, pure Postgres. It's slower, but at least it works. Um, we are retaining full SQL compatibility with the host DB and including all the features, all the interface and so on. It skates uh, vertical and it skates horizontal. For that, we are working with Postgres XL. So we also have horizontal scalability and it integrates easily into all the common IT infrastructures and tools. And thank you very much. It was a pleasure presenting this to you. Thank you. One last question, come on. So what's the hardest thing about building an FPGA accelerator? The long, long time it takes to implement stuff on FPGAs today because high-level synthesis is not yet good enough, it's coming. And, as, and uh, we are very much look forward to reducing the time uh, for implementation because um, the software development is so much faster than the FPGA development, but it's all interlinked. And that is really, really difficult. Okay. Yeah, but that's getting better. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, thank you for coming. I thought we had some amazing talks this, this semester. Um, before we go, we want to thank Hollowpoint Karen for arranging for all of this. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you, Kevin. All right, guys. So that's it for the semester. We do have a multi B talk next Monday if you're interested. Um, and then we'll pick up in the spring semester. All right, guys? and take care. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good luck from me too. <laughs>
Let's take a trip to the far side and black suits troops the group on the stalk. And the uncivilized island of New York where the criminals run the project, develop into drug spots. I be sleeping through the screens and rapid fire shots. My block consists of multiple juvenile offenders and their crews. I'm telling you, even free sense get dead. So these kids making fix peep this. Operation safe home ain't shit. Giuliani got these perpetrating housing cops on the dicks. Now ain't this a bitch?